Anyways. Hello, everybody. It's loud. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here today at Holy Bridges, the role of religion in American polarization. Now, um, my name is Dinaat Rahman, and I'm the director of the Inclusive America Project here at the Aspen Institute. And um, I think we can all accept that religion can be a force for good or evil in the world, that polarization is something that um, currently divides us, and there are many different types of polarization that exist um, and that we feel in our country today. Um, my hope for the panel today is that we explore what those two things look like when they intersect. And I, I, I hope that you all are here because you think that religion can be a force for good in the world. And I hope that our panelists will, will articulate um, and explore the reasons why and how that is. Um, so today we will have brief opening remarks and then we will do our panel and leave a lot of time for Q&A and robust discussion. That will be followed by a reception outside where we can all uh, talk and get to know one another more. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce my friend and colleague, Ibu Patel, who is the executive director and founder of the Interfaith Youth Corps. Thank you, Zenat. Uh, my name is Ibu Patel. I'm president and founder of an organization called IFYC. And uh, people might have caught about a week ago, Ross Douthat of the New York Times reviewed three current books on polarization in America. Did anybody see this column? Uh, uh, I think Michael Lynn's book and uh, Ezra Klein's book and one other book. Uh, and uh, um, he says at the end, the one topic that these authors don't talk about, which ought to have been addressed, is the central role of religion in contemporary American polarization. And then he ends the column without addressing the central question of, central issue of religion and American polarization. Uh, and that's what, that's what we're gonna do today. Uh, actually, this, law, this public program coincides with uh, a long-term project that Zenut's uh, uh, Inclusive America Project and IFYC are doing together. It's with a dozen colleges, about half of whom pro understand themselves as evangelical Christian in nature, and about half of whom are clearly on the politically progressive side of the spectrum. And as we see it at IFYC and at the Inclusive America Project, it is hugely important to have campus environments which form people in religious identities or otherwise but not do it in a way that bubbles them off or serves as a barrier between people. Do it in a way in which encounters are healthy and which pluralism can be built. And so this is actually the beginnings of that two-year project as well. And we thought that, that in the kind of launch of that, and there's delegations from those colleges sprinkled across the room, we wanted to bring some national experts to the stage to address a DC audience and also that college audience to help them as they develop their programs. Uh, before uh, um, having Dan uh, Porterfield come up here, I just want to say part of what I think is powerful about uh, addressing the role of religion in American polarization and its possibilities for pluralism is that you can argue that this is the dimension of diversity that America largely gets right from the founding, and in some ways from even before the founding, from the time of Roger Williams, at least the statements of Roger Williams and the Flushing Remonstrance, this is really the, the United States is, is the world's first attempt at a religiously diverse democracy. We've had metaphors like city on a hill from the 17th century that have taken different shape and form in the hands of a John F. Kennedy or a Ronald Reagan or Barack Obama. We've had metaphors like beloved community, cathedral of humanity, better angels of our nature. As we recognize the role that religion plays in American polarization, I think that there's a lot of work, but also a lot of hope in the area of what it could mean for American pluralism. Uh, thank you, Ibu. Uh, I'm Dan Porterfield, the president and CEO of the Aspen Institute. Uh, and I'd like to thank all of you for being here, and especially 
CNOT and her team for all of your leadership in helping to create some of the most important and most dynamic programming that this institute sponsors. And that's saying a lot because we have 80 programs and 500 employees. We have institutes in 11 nations around the world. And so uh, what you're doing is really setting a standard for all of the work that Aspen does. And it's very much consistent with the core values of the institute, which are about bringing people together for serious and respectful engagement in the hopes that we can move forward and drive change that makes a difference on the most important issues of the day. Uh, I'd like to, um, in addition to thanking uh, Zenot and Ibu, um, also thank the, uh, the Fetzer Institute and Charles Koch Foundation for their support of this conversation today. And religious pluralism has always been, or respect for religious pluralism, has always been at our best, a hallmark of our country. Um, a part of that true, one more term, network of mutuality, uh, of which Dr. King spoke. Um, and as Zenot recently wrote in an op-ed piece on the Hill, um, Religious pluralism is under some new attack uh, in our country today. Um, 2019 saw the greatest increase in violence uh, against religious communities in almost a decade in our country. In the, in the piece that uh, Zenot wrote, she observed that religious freedom is sometimes perceived as something that protects some people at the expense of others. It's not how it should be, but that's how it's sometimes perceived. And this this misperception of pluralism can be very divisive. Um, in order for our religious diversity to be a strength, Zenot wrote, it must be fun to hear your words. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we need a radical reimagining of how we perceive religious freedom and its connection to all faith communities. Um, and that's what this is about today, I think. Um, over three quarters of Americans claim a religious affiliation. Yet we continue to see clashes over religious divides, often stoked by third parties that are really getting some advantage out of the appearance of disagreement, dissent, and rejection of pluralism. The Inclusive America Project is tackling this issue by bringing together values-based leaders from all sectors to affect change and to find ways forward um, and that's critical for this country and for all countries, for our world. Um, I, I was a college professor and a president for 20 years before I came to this role. And so I saw just so many times how our campuses can be extraordinary resources for the human and educational project uh, of creating community across the supposed divides of difference. Uh, I was at Georgetown University for 14 years and then at Franklin and Marshall College for eight. In fact, at Franklin and Marshall College, I saw that our, our men's soccer team lost the NCAA tournament to several of the schools represented here today. Both Calvin uh, and Kenyon sent us packing. Uh, so uh, that's one more thing you agree on. Um, but what I loved about being in ca the campus environment was seeing how all the different resources can be used to promote critical breakthrough conversations about religious pluralism. At Georgetown, for example, um, the university has hired full-time chaplains from across multiple religious traditions. It's a Catholic school, but it has a full-time imam, a Hindu chaplain, uh, at least, I think, two full-time rabbis, um, Orthodox chaplain. It's exciting to see that part of the school's mission played out in providing an environment where there can be religious leadership for students from multiple religious traditions. And um, at the same time, the place offers courses uh, in all religious traditions, uh, has a, a theology major and a minor, um, provides a framework where students can travel together to places of religious importance and learn from one another's traditions, um, unite students around the themes of justice, and help students find some of the overlapping possibilities of collaboration and connection. Um, I remember being super inspired by seeing uh, Georgetown's uh, men's student group that is a conservative Catholic approach um, and the uh, campus Hillel teaming up to work on genocide in Sudan, for example. Um, never did I see this more beautiful, more profoundly, if, if painfully, than on September 11, 2001 
where um, that day at Georgetown, when I was you know, senior vice president and professor, we were coping with the uh, unfolding tragedy and saga and fear um, when uh, the, the towers were knocked down and then when the Pentagon was struck. And we had thousands and thousands of 18 to 22 year olds and their faculty and their parents and our alums all crying out for information and for protection and for safety. And one of the things that I observed that day um, and in the subsequent days was how every single religious tradition was holding services that then were extended to all, all other students of all traditions or no tradition. There was a mass and then there was a Muslim prayer service and there was a Jewish prayer service again and again and again. Everybody was going flocking to each other's services in order to try to find some perspective. Um, and when a day or two into this nightmare, with the death toll starting to rise for the campus itself, a uh, professor and her family had been killed, several alums and grad students were killed, parents of students were killed, um, and we held a, as a sort of a moment of silence with candles on our lawn, the whole school turned out. And though it was the worst possible prompt for religious inclusion and community, it also was a blessing in that moment that there was something that existed that we could tap because we never could have invented it if we had to. And the schools that hadn't attended to the religious traditions of their students and faculty and staff, that hadn't built the conversation that brought people together, that day and those days, they got through it, I guess, but they were starting from scratch. And it was wonderful to be at a place where it had happened. Um, creating the enabling conditions for our students and for all of us to live those questions of sameness and difference, of common purpose, and of personal conviction is incredibly powerful, especially for the young, as they're forming and reinforcing values and mindsets they'll carry with them for long lives of difference making in our society. Campuses aren't Eden, they're not utopia. And so even as we see so many signs of hope that come when communities work together to build their religious understanding, tolerance, and inclusion, to inform one another, and to create a beloved community, we also know on campuses that sometimes there'll be incidents of intolerance. The same place I spoke of, Georgetown, I was there for several different moments of great pain, but one of which was when um, there was vandalism to the campus menorah during Hanukkah and student groups from all traditions <coughs> pulled together um, and stood together and said no to intolerance and to hatred, stood out at night and sat vigil by the, Hanuk by the, by the menorah um, for days on end. And um, there were days when some students felt in that moment that hatred was present on their campus and their campus wasn't what they thought it was. This happens on every campus. Every single campus always has these moments too. When individuals usually acting under the veil of ignorance as cowards, I mean, as ve the, or the veil of an anonymity as cowards, um, send a signal that one group is not to be respected or included. And they create a sense of a, um, a feeling of unease or mistrust that one can be themselves in that campus. That happens on every single campus too. Um, what, is it, what is our response? It has to be to boldly and consistently and persistently and optimistically bring people together constantly when it's not needed in, th in theory. Um, when it's not a moment of crisis, bring people together for discussion, mutual understanding, fellow feeling, um, the important work of building bonds of connection so that we can then together withstand any tests to those bonds, which among college campuses and among 18 and 22 year olds in the world we live in will continue to happen too. Um, and so one of the things that we all kind of agreed to, I remember in these big discussions at Georgetown on that incident, and there were others, was that um, the, our campus wasn't heaven, uh, it wasn't Eden, it wasn't a utopia, but that what happens on college campuses 
the best work on college campuses can be a resource for the country as a whole. The pro we weren't immune to the problems of American society, but we could be part of the solution, as long as we committed ourselves to consistent effort to build true bonds of respect, understanding, and love. And so I think that's what we're about today. Um, and each of us grows as an individual because we place ourselves in relation to uh, other human beings with an open mind and an open heart and try to listen and learn from their experiences and their belief systems and their commitments, religious and otherwise. And in helping us as a society to build the vocabulary and the practice for doing that well, you're making impacts that go well beyond the immediate community in which you work. And for that, we thank you. Now, Zinette, thank you. Thank you, Dan. That was beautifully said, and thank you, Ibu. Always eloquent. Um, I just I want to turn over to the panel. So if I could ask all the panelists, Tom Jelton, to come on stage, um, and Tom will introduce the rest of the panelists, and we can get started. Thank you, Zena. And uh, I'm Tom Jelton. I'm correspondent for NPR News, where I cover religion. I've covered many other things over the years, but this is this is an area of coverage that I feel particularly strong about. And I'm delighted to be here to, today. I'm delighted to have this uh, privilege of moderating this extremely important discussion. You know, Dan, I wanted to just throw something out um, in support of what you were saying about Georgetown. I wrote a book a couple of years ago about new immigrants. And one of the characters uh, in the book was a young man from Libya who had grown up in a pretty secular uh, environment in Libya. Uh, even though Libya is a, a very, of course, Muslim country, he actually grew up in a pretty secular household. And uh, after he came here as a high school student, he sort of got in touch with his faith in a way that he hadn't been in touch with it back in Libya. And he went to Georgetown. And interestingly enough, he credits Georgetown and the chaplain, I think it was a Catholic chaplain there, who actually encouraged him to explore his faith. So here he is showing up as a, a young Muslim at a Jesuit school, and it's in that environment that he discovers and is able to explore his faith. It's, I think it's a real tribute to the kind of climate that you have established here. So, um, and, I, and I understand from what Ibu said that there's a lot of important work being done uh, in your campus communities right now. I'm especially interested in enlarging the conversation uh, to where we are as a, a nation. Uh, and it's, uh, of course, all the more important given that today is the official kickoff of the 2020 presidential campaign, um, I think it's probably easiest to see the phenomenon of polarization in political terms. I think it's been a long time since we have seen an election taking place in a climate of such extreme uh, polarization. Uh, and the data on political polarization are pretty clear. Jonathan Rauch, in a, an article some of you may be familiar with in the uh, National Affairs last fall, laid it out pretty clearly. Among both Democrats and Republicans, it's now a minority who believe it's a good thing for elected officials to be willing to compromise. The number of people in both parties who see themselves as centrists is shrinking. Mm -hmm. And this is, to me, the most alarming uh, trend. The share of both Republicans and Democrats, both Republicans and Democrats, who have very unfavorable opinions of the other party has more than doubled in the last 20 years. In both parties, the vast majority say the opposing party represents a threat to the nation. Now, um, as far as religion's polarization is concerned, and as you mentioned, Ibu, that's really the narrower focus of our uh, discussion today, but um, the truth is that religious polarization actually coincides to a great extent with political polarization. I did a, a piece on this with Alan Cooperman 
not very long ago, and here's Alan here, <laughs> right here, about how, how you know, the two phenomena actually look very much alike. Uh, you see, for example, I mean, there are many ways in which they coincide, but for example, the uh, likelier that somebody is unaffiliated uh, in religious terms or a non-believer is going to sort of suggest that they're inclined towards uh, liberal or progressive positions or the Democratic Party. The more religious somebody is, the more likely they're going to be identified with conservative or Republican uh, ideas. So we see that uh, correlation. Um, now, none of this is really uh, a much of a surprise, I'm sure, to anyone in this room. But here's what makes it somewhat more problematic as far as what we're discussing today. Um, turns out that the more extreme an American is, the more likely he or she is to vote. Uh, we're seeing this. Uh, so the phenomenon of higher voter turnout may indicate you know, greater civic en engagement, but it may also indicate greater polarization. It may be a measure of more polarization. One more thing to throw out before we turn into the actual discussion. Uh, in that National Affairs article, Jonathan Rauch made the argument that this increased polarization that we're seeing is based more on tribalism than it is on issues. It's not so much an ideological uh, difference that defines this new polarization. It's this kind of almost emotional or passionate uh, division. He writes, partisans are not so much rallying for a cause they believe in as banding together to fight a collective enemy. It's not so much that we like our own party, is that, but that we detest the other. And what we are doing is satisfying a deep urge to bind ourselves to our group, our tribe, by displaying animosity toward a note group, another tribe. Now, what we're going to be exploring here today is what re role religion plays uh, in this polarization, and it's kind of a double-edged sword. Um, whether, on the one hand, religion, uh, we might think, can certainly contribute to depolarization and bringing people together through bridge building, I would say, I think inst instinctively, that's what we would like to think. Uh, and there are you know, data to suggest that uh, you know, the more religious somebody is, the more likely to be uh, involved in voluntary organizations uh, you know, and community uh, institutions. Um, but I, we have to recognize that religion can actually exacerbate polarization. Um, I mentioned that um, the more religiously active someone is, the more likely they are to vote. But the more likely they are to vote, the greater the chance that they may actually be voting for an extreme political pos uh, position. Um, so I think one of our tasks here today is to try to sort this out, uh, to consider uh, under what conditions religion can bring people together, but also what conditions, uh, under what conditions religion is actually driving people apart. And we have uh, an ideal uh, panel to explore these issues with us today. Um, all of whom I think in their own personal experiences uh, are uh, really living these values. I'm going to begin with, with you, Justin, because you have a very um, specific uh, commitment to this. Justin is the, one of the founders of the AND campaign. And in this case, as, as Justin mentioned to me, uh, AND is not an acronym. It's, it's a conjunction. It's in this particular, I think in the work of, of, of his organization, it's about connecting the social justice agenda with the moral order agenda. The social justice agenda, agenda being one that we normally associate with progressives, the moral order agenda being one that we more associate, more likely associate with conservatives. Uh, Justin's organization is really committed to bridging those two agendas. Um, and uh, we have uh, Paul Miller on the far end. Paul, I think Paul in his own way also sort of embodies kind of bridge building, if only in a vocational way, and that you have a, a day job and then a ha hobby, as you put it. Uh, in his day job, he is uh, co-chair of the Global Politics and Security Concentration at Georgetown University, where he teaches. But he is also active in the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, and he has a podcast, and he's very interested in sort of these uh, issues of identity and polarization. And he has, as I say, a podcast where he explores some of those issues. Um, Sheila Katz, uh, CEO of the National Council of Jewish Women. 
And I think Sheila today will be uh, talking about some of the work her organization does, uh, living out Jewish values and turning progressive ideals uh, into action. And uh, Asma Yudin, uh, and for, for whatever reason, Asma and I have been on a number of panels together. <laughs> uh, Asma is the author of a very important uh, new book, relatively new, I guess it came out about a year ago, When Islam is Not a Religion, uh, Inside America's Fight for Religious Freedom. And Asma brings to her work a deep commitment to religious freedom, one that she exercised uh, as an attorney at the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty but also in making the argument, which seems to be necessary to be made over and over again, that religious freedom should apply to all faith communities and not just one. Uh, and in particular, I think she has been a very strong advocate for religious freedom for the uh, Muslim community. So those are our four panelists. And I'd like to begin by asking each of you, um, and I can begin with you, Asma, since you're right here to my immediate left, to play sociologist a little bit and tell me what you sort of, how you understand this phenomenon of polarization. Do, have you seen it? Do you agree that it is uh, getting more severe? How do you see it? And sort of what is your explanation for it? Sure, and Tom, by the way, every time we are in a panel, he always chooses me for like the most awkward or hardest questions. Um. <laughs> it just seems that way. Um. <laughs> I mean, I think for me, it's um, the, the switch from having a conversation in which we might disagree with another person, with one, a place where we might think that another's position is wrong, to a situation where we've shifted from the person is wrong to the person is fundamentally bad, which then also just also creates a situation in which you don't, don't even want to engage with them, right? You might have reason to believe that this person holds a very different perspective than what I hold, and therefore, I'm not even going to engage in this conversation. And I think I do see, I, I see more of that. I think there's plenty of causes for that. I think that that's been a subject of tremendous um, research and commentary. Uh, that definitely social media plays into that. I think the way that our national leaders uh, paint certain questions such that they tend to reinforce this idea that people on different sides of the aisle are fundamentally, um, it's fundamentally a battle between good and evil. Um, I think that is the, the crux of our polarization. And when you begin to think of this idea that where people are moralizing the discourse, where they're turning it into a question of go essential goodness versus essential badness, that I think it becomes even more evident that religion has a particular role to play in that. Um, because religion is the source and, of morality for so many people, right? That, that's our moral guide. And so in, in, if we allow religion to be politicized, we're gonna, it's just gonna be another tool uh, for us to have that sort of moral distinction. But if we allow religion to actually be an absolute guide in and of itself that tells us a different idea of what is good, uh, maybe we can overcome this, this moral Do you think the religion that uh, having a strong faith makes one feel sort of more certain about the world and therefore mm -hmm. maybe a little bit less willing to compromise or you know, be interested in relative um, perspectives? Well, I mean, I, I think I can definitely see the way that's been used in that respect, but I actually think that having an absolute sort of a, a place where you know that there is a truth, right, and that we aren't just engaging in this conversation in order to defend our version of the truth. And I, I remember this being most clear to me uh, when I was testify. I testified one time for the House Judiciary Committee years ago, and I just remember it was like this five-hour testimony, and the entire time, like, this show has nothing to do with a quest for truth. Nobody here is actually in, interested in getting to the truth. It's all about different people sort of pushing their own agenda and trying to back that up and get me to sort of say the thing that will support their version. Um, and so I, that to me is sort of like a symbol, sort of like a microcosm of politics generally, mm -hmm. that it is not a quest for truth. It is a quest to prove your point um, mm -hmm. and to win. And I think that in contrast to that, religion does have that absolute truth. Right. Sheila. Great. Um, well, thanks for ever having me here. This is wonderful. I, I want to start with a quick personal story and take my 501c3 National Council of Jewish Women hat off for a minute, because um, we don't talk about candidates in that space. But this is just one with my family, because I happen to come from a pretty right-wing family, and I happen to be fairly progressive. And in the last presidential election, um, I got really, really upset in a conversation with a particular family member when I learned that they were voting for Trump. And 
<clears throat> and normally I can handle my emotions well. I've taught people about dialogue and engaging people across difference. And I just, I really felt like my body was on the line in this election because of reproductive health rights. And I felt threatened in that moment and I kind of exploded. And, and this person said to me, uh, you know, Sheila, I'm happy to tell you why I'm voting the way I'm voting and why I feel the way I feel, but only when you're ready to listen to me. And it was a really important moment for me because um, I don't know if in the beginning of the conversation I was ready to listen, um, but by the end of the conversation, what I heard w was to them for the last eight years that I hadn't been listening to their source of frustration, and I was simplifying the problems that they identified as something couched in ignorance or just a difference in opinion. And I think for me, it was um, eye-opening to be reminded of the importance of actually digging deep in the relationships we have across difference and understanding it. And I feel actually as an activist, it's very important to have relationships with people who feel different than you um, in order to understand and be open to changing your mind, but also because it's helpful in activism to understand the opposite perspective as you're trying to engage. And so I, th I think it was important, I think, for me to acknowledge that I don't think I did my part before we got overly polarized in, in really understanding. And I think that contributed to a lot of this, that it seemed simpler just to say, well, that person is a little this, or that person is a little this, and not actually digging deeper. Um, so that's point one. And two is, because I spent so much of my career working with universities and on college campus, um, I saw a phenomenon on the college campus that I feel like is a little bit of a microcosm of the way we live our life, which is when students arrive to campus, it's big, and in order to make campus smaller, they find people who are just like them, mm -hmm. right? It's why when I worked at Hillel for so long, we were able to really find Jewish students so quickly because they wanted to find each other. Um, and I think the university does a really good job of allowing people to segment themselves out into like-minded groups of people, um, but then sometimes doesn't do the best job of bringing people back together. I, I don't see, like, you have a, a fair when you start, you could find the Black Student Movement or the Muslim Student Association, Hillel, whatever, but then there's no, no fair to go then meet other people and really engage in that way. And so I think campus has always felt like a really important moment, one of the most or most diverse times in somebody's life where they're really around people different than themselves to figure out how to engage. And so I just think so often it's easier to be around people who agree with us, to be around people who share what I would say similar values and um, thinking to us. And we actually have a responsibility to figure out how to shake that up a bit and to make sure we're still feeling safe enough, right? We don't want to ever put ourselves in a place where you know, we feel threatened, uh, but that we really do our part in teaching people the pro-social skills necessary to engage and that we encourage productive discomfort um, as a way that I think will directly address polarization. So, Sheila, do you th is there a risk, do you think, in students, for example, uh, gravitating toward their own faith communities in that sense, as opposed to sort of mixing with the students that are in the same course of study or, or something like that? I mean, yes and no. I think everybody needs spaces in which they're around people who are similar to them. We see this in the women's group, LGBTQ groups. You want people who have similar identities to you, but you don't only want that. I think mm -hmm. it becomes problematic if we don't ever break outside in those spaces. I also want to just name something that I think I don't know if it's so unique to the Jewish community, but it's certainly exacerbated in the Jewish community. 70% of non-Orthodox Jews have one Jewish parent, right? So sometimes we talk about interfaith thinking that we're talking about two different people coming together. In Jewish tradition in the United States right now for Jews, many of our families are interfaith, and many of just our existence in the world are interfaith. And so it's a really interesting thing to also just acknowledge and celebrate the fact that in a in, a, in America right now with growing diversity and, um, and interfaith marriages in general, uh, that we're actually, Generation Z is the most diverse ever religiously as well. And that for many young Americans today, they have parents with two different religions or one religion and somebody who doesn't identify as religious. And I think sometimes we forget that in the equation. Um, what I see for young people in particular is that they hold a multiplicity of identities right. and it can't ever be separated. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important that we hold space for all of those identities when we're engaging with them. Thank you. Uh, Justin, I want to give you a sort of a fo more of a focused question. How hard is it in your organization to sort of connect the two 
agendas that I referred to in the beginning. Um, in this time, is it, how challenging is that? So to connect justice and more order? Yeah. I think it can, thinking can be tough um, because in addition to what the ladies were saying, which I, I think is right, I think one of the problems that we have is that everybody's trying to protect their narrative. Mm -hmm. And as, was, as we talked about a little earlier, it's not necessarily about getting the tr to the truth. It's about making sure that your narrative is uninterrupted and that your narrative is, is completely what you want it to be. Um, and I think when you're talking to a certain side about justice and when that means that it may compromise their self-interest and disrupt their narrative, then they don't want to hear it. <laughs> or if you talk to another, you know, you talk to another group about more order and that kind of disrupts, you know, what they think of, you know, the uh, one's right to define themselves and all that other stuff. They don't want to hear it. You want to maintain that perfect narrative. And I think that's kind of where we run into trouble. But I think the bigger issue uh, maybe is I'm not sure that either side of the aisle has a great understanding of, or appreciation of pluralism and what it really, what it really means. Um, you know, I'm in an interesting space being someone who is a Democrat uh, in a lot of progressive spaces in Atlanta, but also being uh, someone who is a small old Orthodox Christian. And this is a place that a lot of African-American Christians find themselves in. And so when I look on the right, I'm like, I'm not sure you understand pluralism because I see xenophobia being used to get votes and being used for all these other instances to get to gain power to bring people together. It's like, well, you talk about the Constitution, but I don't I don't see that commitment to pluralism when it comes to how you campaign or who you vote for. And then when I look on the left, sometimes I'm not sure that there's a great understanding of pluralism there either. Uh, to me, on the left, sometimes it seems like pluralism is different flavors of progressivism, <laughs> right? So if you're a Christian. As long as you're getting to be progressive or you're a Muslim, as long as you're moving towards being progressive, then it's pluralistic. Otherwise, I'm not sure we want you on campus. We don't want anything to do with you. And I think that's wrong. Pluralism isn't just about the issues that we can wink at and say, ah, let's agree to disagree. I'll see you tomorrow for brunch. Pluralism is about fundamental differences. It's about stuff we say, I really dislike that you think that. But I understand that you have the right to think that. Um, and so I, I think one place to start is, number one, not being so tied to narratives, trying to be more tied to the truth. And then number two, a better understanding of both, on both sides of what pluralism really is. How lonely is that space that you're in? <laughs> I, it can be lonely at times, but I, I, think, I think people get it. I mean, um, once, if you can sit down with somebody and, you know, one of the ways that I put it to people is we enter into conversations more in self-defense than self-examination, mm -hmm. right? So we go into a conversation about race or about gender, about anything else, making sure that I come out again with my narrative intact. Well, you can't get anywhere with that. I mean, some of the best conversations we're gonna have is when I'm willing to s examine myself. That doesn't mean I always agree with you, but I may be one to look inside and say, yeah, I did get that wrong. And until we can get there, I think we're gonna have trouble uh, finding common ground and really, really getting a better understanding of pluralism. So Paul, I guess you're the kind of the uh, academic on this panel, although uh, you're probably not wearing your academic hat today, but um, do you have sort of um, theories or uh, sort of uh, suspicions about what's going on that you can share with us? Yeah, th thanks for the question, Tom. And I should say, um, just by way of introduction, that you mentioned my work with the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission. That's a Southern Baptist organization. I go to a Southern Baptist church, so I'm a Christian. Uh, I'm, you might say I'm an evangelical Christian, but don't worry, I'm not angry, uh, right? Um, so I'm happy to uh, try to speak from within that faith uh, tradition. Um, I, I do approach these things as well as an academic scholar. I did some work with the ERLC about uh, what's uh, driving some of this polarization. Uh, you mentioned a little bit the um, self-sort, right? The demographic changes as Americans are sort of uh, separating themselves into enclaves. Uh, based on their income, course, race, and ethnicity, uh, and everything else. What I've found is that that affects churches as well, right? So the, neighbor, the local neighborhood church also reflects the neighborhood demographics. So when you have a, a, a neighborhood um, of rich white people, the church in that neighborhood is going to be a church of rich white people. And then there's going to be a separate neighborhood church for the poor white people, and then another church over there for non-whites, right? And so forth and so on. And that is a change, right? It used to be, I think that the church would be a place where people would actually mingle across income lines and across age demographics. Not sadly race or ethnicity, it's always been segregated. Uh, but the church, again, used to be a place where the young and the old would worship together, where the rich and the poor could worship together. 
And that's, it's kind of not true anymore. You have churches where the rich worship together, the poor worship together, separate place. And that deprives Christians, it's still the majority of Americans, it deprives Americans and, and Christians of the chance to, to interact, to experience difference, uh, to, um, to blunt the hard edges that they don't see, to get outside of their bubbles. And uh, because that's being perpetuated in our churches, it's depriving us of the very tool we need to, uh, to tackle the problem of polarization. It's becoming an engine of further polarization. Uh, do you see this as a related to sort of the changing religious landscape uh, uh, in the country, uh, the decline of, um, I know that um, Pew data show that, for example, mainline Protestant denominations tend to be much more evenly divided in terms of liberal and conservative ideas, ditto for Catholics, uh, whereas um, evangel white evangelical Protestants tend to be much more on, on, on one side of the spectrum. Um, as you see the decline of some of the more traditional denominations and the rise in Pentecostal and uh, evangelical uh, affiliation, does that sort of contribute to that, do you think? Uh, perhaps. Um, I would also point to a few other trends that I've seen within the uh, Christian churches over the last 20, 30 years. There's been a rise of uh, megachurches, right? Mm -hmm. There's been a, a change in worship style that emphasizes emotion. Uh, Church has become a sort of a form of entertainment. Churches have adopted this seeker-sensitive approach. They want to attract outsiders in. And that's, that's fine for its purpose, but what it does is it says our religion is about making you feel good and making you f uh, experience uh, an, an emotional event, not go to a church to receive character formation mm -hmm. and, and sort of submit to the discipline of, of the teaching you're receiving there. It's a very different vision of what religion is for. And again, if you go to a church for an emotional experience, you're not going to uh, discipline yourself to, um, to uh, form your character a certain way. It's going to make you much more susceptible to the polarization we're talking about. Very interesting. Yeah. yeah. So, um, again, going back to Pew, um, <laughs> I'm glad you're here, Alan. You can correct me if I get anything wrong. Um, it seems that about three quarters of both Republicans and Democrats think religion is losing influence in American life. Three out of four. Republicans and Democrats alike think religion is losing its influence. I'd like each of you very quickly to say if you think that's a bad thing or a good thing. Asma? Well, I mean, somebody who's deeply religious and who has always been motivated by a sincere belief that religion is a source of good, mm -hmm. I mean, even as I'm surrounded by so much um, uh, divides and many of them with religion tied up with it, that has been the driving force of my entire career in religious freedom is that religion is a source of good and it is important for us to protect that space in public um, for, for religion and for the thriving of religion. And so, yes, I think that, um, and also what I said earlier about sort of religion being able to rise above some of our petty differences to give us some, uh, an absolute guide um, with which to f uh, determine our positions that are quite separate from the types of uh, um, guideposts that we have right now. I would, I definitely feel that the, the so lowering influence of religion would be um, a net bad for society. Sheila? Uh, yes, I agree <laughs> with everything you just said. Same for me and my faith. I think, you know, in Judaism, I feel like so often we're really taught to what we call pray with our feet and, and not just sit inside a synagogue or not just sit and talk about text, but to do. And so, and I think the doing is always around things that I really believe are good. And, and so I think it's great when faith can influence people's motivation in civic society. I think it does. I'm actually surprised at the statistics, so I'm just taking it in for a minute. Um, but I think there's also a lot of other factors right now that are compelling people to act. And some t if you asked me what the number one um, you know, compelling factor is, I actually think it would be me as a woman first and me as my faith second. And I wonder how that plays a role when women in this country are feeling you know, a threat to their bodies or feeling not listened to um, in government and in policies. Sometimes the reason we engage is from that particular angle. And so I wonder how our intersectional identities are playing a role in this as people are owning who they are, as people of color are also leading the way in so many of these issues. How does that influence the role that faith plays? Um, but I still think faith plays an important, really positive role 
um, and just want to name, I think we'll get to it, <laughs> that the, the flip side of it is just sometimes I go to marches or protests and I'm really excited to hold my sign with like whatever Jewish text is on it. And then I'll see the counter protest of somebody holding a sign that's very similar also with text on it. And I find that the people I often am in disagreement the most are often people also operating from a faith-based le lens. Um, but I can appreciate that we're all operating from that to try to do what we see as yeah. good in this country. Uh, so, Justin, religion losing influence in America, a bad thing or a good thing? I think it's a net negative, um, and here's why. I think religion is, is powerful. I think we all know that. And the same things that make it important are kind of what make it dangerous. So uh, religion involves absolutes. Mm -hmm. and I, I believe without doubt in my mind that there are absolutes, but if you get that absolute wrong, right, then that's, that's bad. Uh, religion involves understanding um, you know, believing in something that you can't necessarily completely always explain, that you may be able to feel, but you can't always explain it. Um, and, and so, but those are also the things that keep a society going in when, when the spirit of the day is completely out of whack, right? It's gonna be my absolutes, it's gonna be that moral anchor that can actually save a society when everybody's going which way and there's, there's, no other, there's nothing else, there's no other absolute to actually hold everything together. And so I think at the end of the day, not having religion is a net negative because you don't necessarily have that moral anchor. Uh, you don't necessarily have that direction that you may need mm -hmm. when kind of everything else uh, fades away. Mm -hmm. well, well the, the Bible says that true religion is to uh, care for the widow and the orphan, to, to do justice and to love mercy. And insofar as that um, is losing influence, of course it's a bad thing. Right? Mm -hmm. I don't think that's what most Americans think of or experience when we talk about religion. You talked about the rise of tribalism. I think our tribes are becoming our religion. And I think that's not declining in influence, I think it's increasing in influence. I think it's a bad thing, because when our tribes become our true religion, our orienting framework through which we perceive the entire world and define right and wrong, that's um, a recipe for uh, a fractured polity and it's very bad. Yes. I mean, I think we've been talking a lot about religion as providing absolutes, um, but I think when we think of absolutes, we think of this thing that's unchanging um, and cannot be questioned, but I think what makes the absolutes in religion so powerful is the fact that it actually enables a tremendous amount of dissent, right? And this idea is always that as long as our intentions are there um, and the purpose of our dissent and discussion is to reach a truth, um, then the dissent itself is good and it's positive. And so I think it's important to emphasize that part as well. I mean, I think a, a, a common Muslim tradition, especially amongst uh, Islamic scholarly discourse, is to end with, and God knows best, right? This idea that we're fallible, we probably don't get it right, um, but as long as we're engaging in this for the purpose of trying to figure out what God wants us to figure out, then this is a worthy enterprise. Yeah, I'd just add to that. I, I think that's right. Uh, because I think what religion can bring to you is what you're getting is a humility, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, to say, I'm not, I'm not centering myself. I think one thing about modernity and postmodernism is you center yourself. Even with, all, you know, even with all the times we can change our opinions or we can change how we feel, I think religion forces you at times not to necessarily center yourself and say, I've gotten things wrong. I'm in need of something bigger than me. I'm in need of something that transcends me. And without that, I think we often run into a lot of trouble. So, so often when people disagree, you experience that disagreement as a personal threat, as a threat to your identity, because you've invested all you are into having that particular conviction. But I think what, what true religion does, it says, well, look, my, my true identity is not in that thing I believe, but it's in my relationship with God. And if God has accepted me, then I can have confidence, even if somebody disagrees with me. That's not a threat to who I am. I'm eternally secure in the Lord. And that should enable us to disagree more freely, to hold it loose, more loosely. So that was a little bit of a trick question uh, because I was, <laughs> I was holding out the, the second part of it, which was that there is, even though there's widespread agreement that religion is losing influence in America, there's deep disagreement over whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, to, to basically, 63% of Republicans say that's a bad thing. Um, only 27% of Democrats say uh, it's a bad thing. Now, you have all today sort of given testimony to your own, the importance of faith in your own lives is how can you deal with this uh, increased trend uh, of people who uh, aren't affiliated uh, in any way with organized religion? How do you, can I ask you sort of how personally you make this case for religion being a worthy force, not only in your own personal life, but uh, in public life? 
Well, I think when you're looking at this question about you know, how do people feel about the decreasing role of religion, I think it also depends on how we're defining religion and what people are thinking about when they think of religion. And so this project that we're about to start here at the Aspen Institute, uh, it's called The Politics of Vulnerability and the Threat to Religion and Religious Freedom. And so much of the way that religion is discussed, especially in our national discourse, is always framed as often um, the dominant majority, you know, like the, the often white Protestants or white evangelicals specifically, like feeling um, under threat because of the changing demographics and cultural shifts in this country. And from that comes a sense of persecution, of feeling under siege, of vulnerability. Um, and but unfortunately, that vulnerability is unweaponized, right? It's uh, and and what we see is not so much vulnerability as a human phenomenon, but we see it. We see the politics of that vulnerability, and we see it. I think more than more than ever, I see that in our national leaders, um, consistently talking about how they are the saviors of religion, uh, but specifically couching that in terms where it's a very particular religion or a particular interpretation of a religion that is being protected. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, helping to fuel actually concrete measures by a number of these groups that whose mission statement will read that they're fighting the forces of secularization, but they're actually working very concre concretely to challenge religious accommodations for religious minorities. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, well, you're, you want to fight secularization, you want to protect religion, but you're fighting against and you're resisting religious accommodations. And so I think that sort of, that those black and whites um, that are set up um, in too much of our national discourse are sort of seeping into what our idea and what the average American thinks of when they think of religion. Justin, you wanted to jump in. Um, as a Democrat, um, do you find yourself having to put in a good word for faith sometimes? Yeah, or? I think there's a strong case for it. I think there's a strong historical case for it. I mean, if you look at the civil rights movement, what powered the civil rights movement? We don't want to talk about it today, but those, uh, those songs, those spirituals that they were singing had meaning. And they were the reason that I could get beat half to death and look somebody in the eye and say, I don't hate you, right? That's what powered the civil rights movement. What powered abolition? What powered abolition was be belief in something greater, that my enemy isn't the ultimate authority, and therefore they're gonna have to, you know, they're gonna have, have some reckoning to do themselves, and I have a responsibility to do things a certain way. Uh, I think even when you look at eugenics, uh, when you look at the sex trade, these are things that were powered by folks who had religious conviction through all kind of terrible circumstances that they could still look and say, I have the faith. Because in many of these circumstances, there was no reason to believe that the circumstances would change. Like if you were born into slavery, if you're born into Jim Crow, you have very little reason to believe those things will change unless you believe in something greater than anything that's going on around you. And so I think there's a very clear and strong historical case for religion in society. If you look at some of the strongest movements that we've had in this country, they were powered by a devout religion and a belief in something Okay, bigger. that's a historical case. What about in the current moment? Well, I think history always speaks to the current moment, right? Yeah. Past is prologue, so that's how we got here. Um, but I think those are, those are things that people connect with today. I mean, and those are issues, some of those issues are still issues that we have to deal with today. And we look back and say, what powered that? What can help people see past where they are in the moment? I think religion goes a long way in doing that. Sheila? Yeah, well, I, I was just, because Ibu and Zinat are here, I was just thinking back to a conversation that was really powerful for me that I had with them a while back, where I said that I, I wasn't particularly religious, and Ibu pushed back on me and, and shared uh, that, like, because I make meaning out of my Jewish faith and traditions that it meant I was religious. And what I meant by saying I wasn't religious is that I wasn't an Orthodox Jew. And I think there's a lot of people in faith um, who have a particular tradition, who do the foods and do the family stuff and have the values, but have a difficult time claiming being a person of faith mm -hmm. or claiming being religious because they don't feel you know, that they're doing enough. It, it, we sometimes say people say they're Jewish, right, but not Jewish. And, uh, and I would say back to them the way Ibu has said to me that they're Jewish. And part of our identity and part of the changing identity of faith today is accepting that actually the way faith plays out looks different than it has over time. And we can't only default to one particular way of doing that faith as the ultimate answer of what it means to be religious today. So I actually wonder if that question were reframed around whether people were living out their values or living out their faith values, if that actually would increase the answer. I think 
I know tons of people where the word religious is a barrier to them, but then they're doing all the stuff. And so, and for me too, until recently, and I've been working in the Jewish world for over a decade, I had a very difficult time owning what it meant to say that I'm a religious Jew. And, and my existence as a religious Jew is in direct opposite of the way I was taught maybe it would look out, and it would look like. And so I think that that's an important variable. And just one other quick thing I'm thinking in the space of history, um, last, which is, last week isn't history, but something came up. Last week I was with Muslim advocates. It was the three-year anniversary of what I'll call the Muslim ban, and, and it was just announced that it was expanded. And they invited me to speak alongside several members of Congress about that. And I was there speaking as a Jewish person running a Jewish organization. And on the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, talking about what it meant that the Jewish people understand what it's like to want a better life in another country and to be denied that right. And because of understanding that, and because of our history, and because of what our people went through, that is why we are advocates for Muslims right now all around the world. That is why we're involved in the immigration crisis that we're having. That is why I went to the border over the summer. And so it's directly linked our faith tradition, our history, people in our own families, to why we actually do what we do right now in collaboration and, and with other faiths, because that's what we as Jews wanted other faiths to do for us. And so, of course, that's what we would do now. And just you know, as the Jewish educator, I have to throw out, um, there is only one obligation in Jewish text and tradition that outweighs all other, and it's not keeping kosher, and it's not who you marry, it's loving the stranger, and it, because we were strangers. It's said 36 times in the Torah, and so immigration is a deeply, deeply Jewish issue, and right now it's not Jews that we're advocating on behalf of, it's Muslims from around the world. Do you think, and this is for both uh, you and Asma, do you think that as members of a minority faith community, you're sort of um, instinctively mo uh, more committed to pluralism just because you have more to lose as members of a minority faith community? I would say yes, and I would also say, though, that the, the way that I'm defining pluralism uh, might be different than the way other people define pluralism. I think uh, Justin and I, I think, share a lot on that front, both the way he defined it, but also the way that he described his his role, kind of like in the space where he's both um, traditionally religious, but also dedicated to social justice and and issues that people might not put together. I similarly, I feel like I exist in a space where it's uh, just sort of at the crossroads of things that people don't usually think to put together. Where there, it's the robust defense of religious freedom, one that includes the rights of conservative Christians, and then also my identity as part of a beleaguered minority community. Um, uh, in this country. And I remember you asking him, is that a lonely position? Um, that's a question that I often think of. It's, it can be quite lonely, but I think it also creates a lot of space for to make real change. Mm -hmm. I mean, I agree. I also, I think faith is a language. And when you're with people who are faith-based people, you're speaking a similar language. I think, say, especially Muslims and Jews and minority religions. Um, and, and the best example I have of this is when I worked at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, I was a rape crisis counselor. That was my job. I was working at Hillel, but I happened to be a rape crisis counselor. Um, and at one point in time, a Muslim student came to me, and, um, and we had a, a, a rather difficult conversation about an experience that she had. And, um, and a long time later, I was talking about why she came to me and not to one of the counselors on campus or, you know, whatever. There's a variety of reasons. And, and she said, I knew you would understand what it was like for my hijab to be removed and how challenging that was for me. Mm. Well, I want to like sink it. And, and the thing is, I did know how challenging that was for her. I could speak that language with her. And I don't pretend that I know everything about other faiths. But I thought the fact that sometimes we see each other as allies, and we see each other as people that deeply understand certain pains we have of the world maybe not being designed for us, right. I think is something that brings us together in a way that could be really powerful when we choose to come together. I'm going to go to you, Paul, in a second, but I wanted to just build on that with a little anecdote. I did a story um, about young Muslims once, and there was uh, a young Muslim woman there who said that she, she grew up in the Deep South uh, in a very Southern evangelical context, and she said she felt more comfortable around white Southern evangelicals than she did around sort of liberal 
progressive people in the D.C. area, because she said, because she was a pretty devout, so she prayed uh, regularly uh, every day, and she was saying that it would, she found that the evangelical students were much more understanding of her need and desire to pray. Then she didn't have to explain it to them as she did with you know, more secular progressive types. Uh, so that sort of goes along with what you're saying, that there is a kind of a, a common language and common behavior that people of faith share. Paul, um, the question I had uh, put is, can, you know, what is your argument uh, for why religious influence is, is important in public life? Oh boy, why is, uh... hey look, we're out of time. Uh, <laughs> well, actually, you know, you actually started it because you talked about, I think you talked about something like moral discipline. Um, that, you know, a strong faith gives you a sense of, mm. of, of moral discipline that, yeah. you know, makes it sort of makes you more effective as a player in the world. Yeah, yeah so um, th thank you for that. Let me just briefly address the prior question if I could real fast and then I'll, and then I'll yep. try to tackle that. You asked about how we re react to the sort of the rise of the nuns, the right. rise of the unaffiliated. Right. And um, I have a, maybe a unique take on that because generationally, I think what's happening is so many Americans who previously professed a version of Christianity because it was the culturally accepted thing to do, this is just sort of drop the pretense. And from my perspective, I'm kind of happy that my church is smaller because now the only people who are there are the ones who want to be there for the right reasons. You know, The American version of Christendom has gone. Uh, people who participated in sort of cultural Christianity have just, they're not, they're not, they're not uh, doing that anymore. And that's great because now it's easier to kind of say this is what Christianity is. So that's my take on the rise of the nuns. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So your, your question was, uh, why is it important for religion to have an enduring influence? Yes. I, you know, I think I just want to, I almost want to punt that, um, Justin, to you because of everything you said. I think religion is a powerful resource for addressing the full spectrum of issues in our social, cultural, and political uh, issues of the day. Um, both on the right and on the left, both for social justice and for moral order, as you say. Uh, religion provides us resources for addressing these issues. You know, I, I feel politically and culturally homeless because I care uh, for the unborn, I care for the poor, I care for the immigrant, I care for people on all sides, and I, I see one party caring for one, I see another party caring for others, and that's quite frustrating for me. Um, and I would love to bring the resources, the perspective of, of my faith tradition to bear on the full gamut. Uh, Pope John Paul II, I'm not Catholic, but he's talked about the, um, the full garment, the, the full garment of life, right? Uh, to care for those across the full spectrum of their life. And I think that's very important. Uh, you know, let me read this. Uh, the prophet Isaiah says, uh, They who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Right? That is a beautiful image of what I think uh, God promises to those who follow him. And that is a tremendous resource that will enable us to enter the public square, to advocate for justice, to, to defend those who need defense, and to do so with confidence in him and not in ourselves, and to not feel threatened when we encounter opposition as we always will. So this is the, the power of religion, the power that God promises. So I'm gonna give each of you about 15 or 20 seconds, uh, and I can start with you, Paul, um, and come back down, about sort of one practical tip for how religion can sort of serve to bridge pol polarization, to sort of deal with polarization? Uh, I would love to see um, churches uh, maybe partner with other churches that are not like them to start with. Then maybe you can actually look at, at, a, at a mosque or a synagogue, right? <laughs> but let's start uh, with churches partnering with other churches that don't look like them. That would be a great first step. I'd love to see pastors stock their book stalls full of books from authors who do not look like them. Mm -hmm. Um, again, that's a great first step along this road. Justin? Yeah, I would say that, you know, the best thing that I always, always recommend is the application of advocating together, right? right. Finding an issue and saying, I'm going to represent you on this issue. I'm even going to sacrifice political capital because I care about you as a human being. Yeah. And I think that goes a lot further than some of the other stuff we try to do. Great idea. I'll build on that. One of the things I really appreciate about how the National Council of Jewish Women operates is that we operate in coalition. And I think our voices are stronger when we're together. And so just as one example, we just submitted an amicus brief recently to the Supreme Court from 28 faith-based organizations sharing around reproductive health rights and freedom and religious beliefs. 
spanned from Catholic tradition, Jewish tradition, Hindu tradition, Muslim tradition. And I think it was actually a stronger brief because we all came together and shared our perspective on abortion and religion and First Amendment rights. And, and I think that it's a path forward in what it means to actually come together as faith groups and actually demand the faith voice or a faith voice have a seat at the table in our politics today. I would say for religious individuals and communities to not see their religious affiliation as just another source for tribalism, but to understand religion as this broader uh, quest for meaning and purpose and for to, and union with the divine and understand that different people from different religions are in part of the same project and you can absolutely hold to your belief that your path is the only right path um, and still understand that different people are following their paths. And once you understand that we have the same quest and we, specifically in terms of our rights, uh, understand that that quest requires certain actions of people and to be able to, once you have that basic understanding of people that behind all these different claims there is a person and that person is seeking to live out their sincerely held beliefs, um, I think that hopefully can help us sort of break down some of the opposition we see against each other's rights. Well, we've had some great comments uh, and I want to bring you all into the conversation now. I think we have at least, uh, we have a couple of microphones, so let's see some hands and um, we can start right here. Maybe you could identify yourself. That'd be a good idea. Yeah. Uh, Richard Coleman, I graduated from University of North Carolina. Bad basketball year. Um, <laughs> I'd, like to, I'd like to say, throw in, you know, into the punch bowl the, the notion that faith-based somehow imputes uh, some moral superiority. I think that people who have really struggled find out whether religion defines how the universe was born or whether people walk on water or even to set up moral standards is, is a phony equation. People do not need a religious identity to have a feeling about empathy. I love your shirt over there. And I don't see empathy coming out of any of the religious groups. And I'm particularly annoyed when I hear something that, like uh, the United States is a Christian country. What are all the other people? Are they second class citizens? So, uh, and, I, and when Bush had the faith-based initiatives uh, program in the White House and people investigated and they saw money went to a guy on the West Coast who was gonna buy a ship to send food to the poor people in Asia. Instead, he used it to plug the holes in his church budget with no consequences whatsoever. I'd like to see some commitment if you're talking about polarization because I do agree with the comment that people are more strongly identified with their political party than they are with religion, that there be an absolute ban on any merger of church and state because that equals a religious decision, that equals a political decision, and that equals more polarization. Okay, so I'm assuming you're one of those who would say that um, less religious influence in public life is actually um, a good thing. Less, but I would say less religious influence in a government. Right, okay. Did anyone want to specifically mention church and state, Paul? Oh, so very briefly, you mentioned, you know, you don't need religion to be to have empathy or to be a good person. I would just say, within the Christian tradition, I can kind of agree, because the Bible talks about God's common grace, what we say, God, common grace, right? That God calls the rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous alike. So um, God, we're all made in God's image, and we don't... Uh, and, and that means that each one of us reflects him, and whether we believe it or not, I think we do, and that means we all have that same potential, and that same potential for goodness, truth, and beauty. So I think I, I'm agreeing with you that you don't need uh, to, to believe this or that, just to be uh, made in God's image and to reflect his glory. Um, now, church and state, I, again, I'm going to agree with you. Uh, I, I, I actually don't particularly care for that phrase, uh, that the United States should be a Christian nation. Historically, there's some accuracy there about the influence of Christianity, but, but let's leave that aside. Uh, I think... I think probably all of us on the stage would agree with the importance of religious liberty, the, the corollary to which is the disestablishment of a church and state. Uh, and that's actually one of, the, that's one of the great gifts of Baptists to the world, right? We, uh, we started to develop the theology, the theological reasons for the separation of church and state before John Locke wrote his essay concerning toleration. Uh, and so I would hope that my co-religionists would uh, remember those roots and, and agree with you about the separation of church and state. Yeah, I would always, I was, oh. go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I would, I would also, I'd like to invite you to my church because I think you would see <laughs> plenty of empathy. You know, when we, when we do food, uh, when we hand out food and things of that nature, we don't ask what your religion is. And I think you would see that in a lot of, you may not see it, uh, you know, in the media, but you'd see that in a lot of different churches and synagogues and, and, and mosques and so on. Um, the other thing I would say is, you know, 
I don't think the separation between church and state means that people's values, that they don't use their values in, in politics, right? I mean, every law that we have is based on somebody's values. I mean, you, you have to have some kind of, some kind of moral, some kind of, type of value to even have laws. So, so we got to be careful when we talk about the separation of church and state. It doesn't mean completely separating people's values from how they vote or what they think the law should be. I think that's an impossible. I think that's an impossibility, especially for someone who's a, a devout, uh, faith-based person. Yeah. Josh, you had a question. Hi, Josh Good, Ethics and Public Policy Center. Uh, I have a question based on what you said, Asma, and what you said, Paul, about testifying and sort of people not being interested primarily in truth and pastors maybe stocking their bookshelves with different kinds of books in their own tradition uh, about institutions. Um, and the question is, you know, what's your best thinking on, on, on uh, what today's conversation about pluralism means for the nature of institutions themselves, what they should be? Uh, there's this scholar that's got this book out now, you've all lived in on uh, a time to build. It says that we tend to act as, as sort of platforms, um, going to Congress to, to get a bigger mouthpiece, get on CNN, rather than be formed by the institution or pastors or rabbis saying what people think you know, they, they ought to say so that they'll be accepted rather than forming uh, their people and their better angels and the like. Curious as to what, what your best piece of advice might be for, for a journalist or for a pastor or for a political leader on uh, institutions as forms and what that could mean for the pluralism implications. Yeah. Right, so earlier when I was talking about uh, churches and the uh, secret sense of worship and all that, you might have heard some echoes of Yuval's argument because I just read his book and, uh, and wrote a review of it for the Gospel Coalition. Um, so yes, I, I, mean, I, I agree with Yuval's argument that we need to treat our institutions as forms of character instead of platforms of performance. I think a lot of Christians see their church uh, either as a platform for a, a megachurch pastor or even individual believers go there thinking it's a platform to, be in, to, to have an emotional experience as they participate in the, in the song and worship time. Um, I would, uh, so, so I agree with the argument there. Are you asking, like, how do we get back to that in our churches? Or is that kind of what you're asking? Sure, in public life. Yeah, in public life. Um, so the, what I'd say to my fellow Christians is kind of a uniquely Christian argument. I'd remind them of Philippians 2, right? That Jesus emptied himself of his glory and humbled himself to become like us to carry out his mission, right? He did not... Uh, act with his divine glory when he came here. So the, in the incarnation, we see an example of divine humility. That should be the example for all, for all Christians, right? For all people, I think, that we should emulate that level of humility and not look at the world as a stage upon which we can act, because Jesus didn't act that way, right? Instead, we should see the world as a mission field upon which to work and labor as Jesus did, right? So that's kind of my theological answer. As for practical policy, I, I got no idea. <laughs> <laughs> so, if I could answer that. Um, so I think that speaking from using the example of the Muslim community, I think that that helps to shed some light. Um, because I think that the Muslim community, and we've been talking about people who are political orphans. Um, and I think for the, for the community, we, we often feel that we're not fully liked in our most authentic form by either side. right? So we have our own experience of the, being these political orphans. But given the nature of politics and the fact that certain alliances uh, ultimately benefit, right? There's only certain types of people who are willing to actually work with Muslims in order to fight for their rights, oftentimes in coalition with other people's rights. And what these complicated alliances mean that oftentimes Muslims do end up choosing certain positions or saying certain things for the purpose of, and this might not be intentional, it's, it's, a, it's a question of su surviving in a really complicated environment for the purposes of having that platform, right? So there's like the idea that seeking the platform might not just be something that's about our ego, it's about for many people, how to survive. Um, and in response to that, it's you see a number of Muslim leaders, uh, both right of center and left of center, who kind of are commenting on this now, now that Muslim social justice activism is so vibrant, um, and saying, well, OK, this is all great. And we are working in solidarity with you when we think and we support this. And we absolutely believe that this work is, um, is, uh, is um, inspired by a prophetic tradition, it, by, it's absolutely rooted in our ideas, our religious ideas of fairness and good. 
However, we have to be really careful. We have to be careful about the types of alliances. We have to also understand that we don't project our own ideas of what is right and good onto our religious foundation, right? So we see this push and pull happening in the Muslim community. And I think the more we see that, the more we see these hard conversations, and the more that we see the scholars um, who have full graphs of a tradition to be able to say, well, here where we see the cracks, here we see some of the problems, so that we have to be careful that the community isn't just working again just for that platform or what's easiest, um, but for the bigger the bigger good. Uh, hello, my name is Shelby Emmett and I run free speech policy initiatives with Stand Together. Um, right now, one of the issues that we're seeing seems to be this fight between what diversity really matters. Um, one side thinks the only diversity that matters is intellectual, which I don't like that term. And the other side seems to think the only thing that matters is all the diversity except intellectual diversity. Um, in your work, could you all just quickly state, first, where do you think that's coming from? And how has your work shown that all of the different types of diversity, intellectual, religious, all of it, um, has that helped or hindered the work for you to be able to get people to work and cooperate and listen to one another? Very quick answers, please. Well, I'll give a non-answer to your question, <laughs> which is I think it's an interesting conversation to have with the people who feel that way. And I found often when there's debate about who kind of matters in this space, or, or it's really because some people are feeling left out. So how can you create a space where you're bringing the, these voices to the table who feel differently and actually holding a productive conversation where people can share and where you can come up with some answers together? Because I actually don't think me giving you an answer in that space is necessarily going to be the right formula for the community or the organization you're in. But if you know the people to bring in, and as that people grow, you bring more people into the conversation and iterate. But I think it's an amazing conversation to have. Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. Um, you know, representation matters. And so I think, you know, when it comes to where, where power is kind of distributed and all those things, to have people of different races, gender, and that's important. Because if, if, if I look and I see a group and nobody looks like me, well, there's a good chance that nobody's representing me or yeah. nobody understands my perspective. So I think that's understand. I think that's right. Uh, and I think the right, the, the, the right side of the political landscape needs to get that a little better. But on the left, I think there's a completely no appreciation, not no appreciation, but little appreciation for ideological diversity because ideas matter too. Um, and so I think... Both sides can get a better understanding, like I said before, of pluralism and the value of that, right? So on, on the left, you kind of see not a whole lot of talk about ideological diversity, but is, they'll talk about the diversity of, hey, if you have an organization, you need to let everyone in that organization. Was that always a valuable type of diverse, diversity? I'm not sure. So an important conversation, I, I think it depends on the context. Paul, uh, you did a podcast recently with Michael Emerson, who is sort of the godfather of the multiracial church movement. In, from based on whether your own ideas or Michael Emerson's ideas, what is the what is the best argument for why it makes sense to deliberately build multiracial congregations? Yeah, so so Michael Emerson's a sociologist um, uh, who just left University of Illinois, I think, uh, somewhere else, and he's he's talked about how white evangelical churches, even good even when they are well intentioned and try to fight uh, racism, end up. Uh, through their accumulated, ha essentially, as habits, perpetuating racial injustice in structural systems in society uh, because of inherited assumptions about how the world works, a lot of individualism and whatnot. Um, and so uh, churches that are culturally white, churches that are predominantly supermajority white, um, uh, they're epistemic bubbles. Uh, they're self-reinforcing epistemic bubbles where the people who sort of raise in those churches don't get out of it, they don't understand what it's like to not be white or to see through non-white eyes. Um, and so they're not being challenged, they're not being exposed to other perspectives. One of the solutions that uh, I think Michael's tried to talk about is this idea of a multi-ethnic congregation. It's very <coughs> hard to pull this off, because another thing he found is that a church is culturally white so long as it's 51% white. It's culturally white as long as there's a majority of white people. And as soon as it's 49% white, all the white people leave. So for, it goes from 49 to like 10 really fast, right? So it's extremely difficult to have a church that is truly multi-ethnic in culture, not just numbers, and that keeps white people there. So it requires a deliberate commitment by white Christians to, to, to learn, to essentially subordinate themselves to non-white authority. It's, it's, it's hard to, to do that. Yeah. 
Did you want to say anything else, Mom? She wanted everybody to say something. Sure. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, Tom mentioned when he introduced me that I recently came out with a book called When Islam is Not a Religion, Inside America's Fight for Religious Freedom. And when I set out to write this book, I kind of, in some ways, it was the, like a, what seemed like a pretty big task, an almost impossible task. I wanted to bring liberals and conservatives together to some sort of agreement, and I wanted to use the story of Muslims and religious freedom as the medium through which to do that. And so it's a lot of this, not just in the way that I wrote the book, but also the way that I'm speaking about it now that I'm on a pretty um, intense tour, um, is, is, you know, with the book itself, it's like, well, I'm going to talk about religious freedom. And I'm going to use religious freedom as a frame, not just because that's what I have expertise in, but also because I know that it is a matter of great importance to conservatives. I think anybody watching the national news should be very clear about that. Um, and so how do I use this language of religious freedom? One, again, in which I advocate for people of across political and religious lines to bring in the conservative reader, but then also specifically frame the issues that Muslims are dealing with that they might I mean, they often don't have sympathy for, but if you frame it as a religious liberty issue, which is it is, what difference is that going to make? Mm -hmm. And also explaining that these, these attacks on Muslims' religious freedom are, are ultimately going to be tied back to the state of your own freedom, right? If you weaken one, it's, gonna, it's going to weaken yours. You cannot intellectually, jurisprudentially separate the two. Um, and then on the other end, um, I, I sort of front-loaded the book with this very intense discussion of the rights of minorities and Muslims specifically. And then I kind of snuck in a chapter at the end where I talk about my work on the Hobby Lobby case. And I have found that even when, you know, when I see the way that the book is being reviewed and the way that I, when I present the same argument in the same order in more left of center audiences, the way that just sort of teaching them the principle first and teaching the principle in relation to things that they can get, that they can support, um, creates an environment where they're more willing to be in, in conversation, they're more receptive to be in conversation and to think differently about that thing that they disagree with. And this isn't just with liberal audiences, I've seen it work in the other way as well. When I start with saying, I'm not here for the interest of uh, you know, arguing special interest, to argue just for my community and not yours, to privilege one over the other, I'm here for robust religious freedom for everyone and including yours, I just, create, I just see this opening being created in which then they're now more, much more willing to hear what I have to say about Muslims than they would have otherwise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Todd Wiggins. Uh, I'm very interested in this presentation from the standpoint of the idealism that there could be churches that are very diverse and survive and be successful. And I'll give a case in point example. Church of the Epiphany, 1314 G Street, Northwest, D.C. Okay, okay, okay. I think that's a great place to start as, a, as an example of what appears to be a successful, thriving, multicultural church. I believe that this can happen anywhere, it should. And until we learn to do this, we never really will live together peacefully, right? So okay. can you give any other examples of places that you've been to where there have been great diversity in the spiritual environment? Uh, Tom, can I make a suggestion that we just do several questions and then do, make that the last round? Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Paul Rauschenbusch from IFYC, and I was just wondering, Interfaith Youth Corps, I was wondering if any of you might offer an example of the kind of discipline, whether spiritual, psychological, that it took to um, to show solidarity across lines of difference when it it would involved a sacrifice of either power or um, or your own community's like sense of trust of you as like a solid ally. I mean, just wonder like what does it take spiritually to do the work that we're talking about today? Mm -hmm. Another one. I think we'll make this from the last one. Thank you. Uh, Mary Ellen Geis with Interfaith Youth Corps. We were talking a little bit about the rise in the unaffiliated, and we've been talking about religion and politics mm -hmm. and the way that they relate together. I think there's some research, I'm pretty sure it's Robert Putnam, that points to the fact that it's the, the bringing those two things together that actually creates some of the distrust for institutionalized religion. So the intertwining of religion and politics in that dynamic. And I'm just, I'd love to hear your comments on, to me, as I view that, it's 
bad for institutionalized religion, for those of us who care about that, that the connection of religion and politics is driving people out of religious communities. Um, but secondly, it seems to be problematic for religious pluralism if we're finding those two reinforcing identities actually deepening people into tribalism. So we'd just love to hear your comments on that dynamic of religion and politics um, more deeply intertwining and what, if anything, we can do to ameliorate the, the stress that that puts on religious pluralism. Yeah. Okay, we got um, three questions here. One, whether any of us has any uh, example of, uh, actually, I'm gonna just take this myself if I can. Because <laughs> um, I was just in Dallas uh, and profiling a, a plant church. Um, and I'm sure many of you know that a plant church is one that starts from scratch, often in a, like a storefront or something like this. And this particular pastor began sort of with the organic experience of his community. Uh, which was a very needy, very low-income, sort of um, problem-plagued community. And he found that if you sort of begin there and build from the ground up, uh, it's much more effective than starting. I contrasted that with another church where it was a really deliberate effort to sort of become multi-ethnic um, through changing music and signage and so forth. Far more difficult, but if you'd sort of let that church kind of grow out of organically out of the, a particular community with shared needs, uh, it seems to work uh, much better. Um, two other questions. Um, one, any of you have any thoughts about, and Justin, you sort of alluded to this, having to sac, what kind of compromises are necessary? What kind of, you know, having to sacrifice some of, you mentioned political capital, uh, or maybe, you know, principles, uh, something that you believe in in order to sort of um, achieve some kind of comedy or something. Yeah, I, I would just say generally, um, you know, at least, you know, for my religion, I can speak on that. It does involve self-sacrifice, right? And so one of the things that I think religion can do is love can be a nebulous concept, right? It can be, you, you never know what that means. Is it when something, a tragedy happens that we send uh, our, our thoughts and prayers, which I don't dismiss, but when you have uh, the issue and the, and the solution in your, in your sphere of influence, that may not really be love, right? If that, that's all that you do. And so I think one of the things that we can learn from religion is that self-sacrifice is, and I talk a lot about the, the politics of Christian self-interest. If your politics are just about you and getting what you want, to me, that's not what my re religion represents, right? It's about the vulnerable. It's about others. It's about sacrificing for other people. And if we really use that, instead of using religion, as we talked about, as a means to get power for ourselves, and that's where you run into the problem. And I push back a little bit with Yuval Levin. I haven't read the book. Because in the African American community, that connection was so necessary. Like you, you needed the you needed the connection between your church and politics because that, that was the only institution that you actually controlled, yeah. right? But I think the problem comes when it's just about power and it's not about the self sacrifice and kind of helping those in need. Yeah, I can build off this because the National Council of Jewish Women was founded 125 years ago this year in Chicago when Jewish women were the only Jews invited to present at the Chicago World Fair and when they got there were told to pour coffee instead and uh, so they said no and they left and they founded NCJW to make sure Jewish women had a seat at the table to advocate on behalf of the most vulnerable in their communities particularly women children and families because Jews and particularly Jewish women were not given a seat at that table for any reason. And so interestingly enough, we historically were an organization that started on the premise that we weren't welcome because we weren't. Universities, by the way, also had quotas around Jews and how many they would allow in and when they hit the max amount at about 10%, I think it was. Yale, there's some good research about that. And so I think now we also are operating from a place of um, a, a different place uh, where still we have to fight for this. Jews are often left out of progressive communities because of our relationship with Israel. It's still something that continues to happen that we're often navigating that's really, really difficult. But for the most part, we're operating in many spaces as people of power. And we're navigating what it means to be both a minority group, uh, to be an oppressed group, to be a powerful group. And I guess with that comes the first question that 20% of Jews are Jews of color. 
And often when we look around Jewish spaces, we don't see Jews of color. And part of that is because our community has historically done a very bad job of welcoming people of color into the community. They usually have welcomed them with a lot of questions. And that's not actually what it means to be welcoming. And so there has been transformation in the last several years in Jewish institutions to acknowledge the growing diversity of people in this country, particularly in faith communities. And what I want to say about people of color in general in this country is this is the last moment in time where we will ever have a Caucasian majority in this country. And so the generation that comes after Generation Z is not going to be a Caucasian majority. I'm excited by this, and I think it plays a role into how we do welcoming and inclusion can work. You, can you mention, can you respond to the specific thing he said? Is there an instance when you've had to, uh, in the interest of making an alliance with somebody, had to compromise your own sort of institutional position on something? I mean, yes, I would say, off, particularly sometimes in the Israel space, yes. Um, I think what we want to do always is be at the table with people who agree with us on the particular issue we're seeking to address. Um, it doesn't mean people have to agree with us on everything that we care about. And because we were founded to protect women, children, and families, and the most vulnerable, who often used to be Jews, who sometimes are Jews, but usually not today, right? We're advocating on behalf of people of all sorts of diverse faiths. I think we have to, we'll show up at any seat. Like, mm -hmm. I will work with whatever administration member needs, if they're willing, right, would work with us. It so happens that they haven't been willing to work with us in this current administration. But if we knew working with somebody would allow us to push the Violence Against Women Act through the Senate, we would do that. And, and I'll say most notably a pain point um, that I just have to name, and I actually imagine we have different perspectives on this panel, is that in Jewish tradition, abortion is permitted. It's not only permitted, but sometimes it's required. And, and in Jewish tradition, a fetus doesn't have a soul. And so oftentimes when we're talking about religious freedom, I think um, there's been a, loud, um, a louder voice from the Christian right not necessarily uh, the exclusive voice. And I sometimes like to ask the question of like, whose religious freedom are we talking about here? And what does it mean that like, for me, my uh, freedom of religion is really tied up in what it means for me to exercise my own beliefs in my own body. And so I've been, the biggest pain point I have now is what it means to feel like we're left out of the equation and the conversation of freedom of religion and abortion and what it means that we so clearly have a position across all sects of Judaism that gets left out. And I would actually ask those who disagree with me to also advocate for the Jewish like voice on that position because it's not fair for us to not have a choice about our own bodies and what we can do and what we can't do because our faith informs that. Finally, uh, and this has to be quick, I think, because we need to wind up. Um, uh, Mary Ellen uh, had a question about the whether there's a danger with the intertwining of religion and politics. Paul? Yeah, so I guess I would go back again to the idea that true religion is uh, to do justice and to love mercy. If you find yourself, if we find ourselves defining justice as victory for my tribe, well then take a good hard look in the mirror because then we're part of the problem. Right? And I think that's kind of the situation we're in increasingly with this tribalism is we're defining justice as victory for my side. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's what, um, what the Bible meant when it said do justice and love mercy. It meant to care for the least of these and advocate for uh, those who cannot advocate for themselves. So I would uh, leave that as a plea. That's kind of also an answer to the question from the back about what are the personal disciplines that it takes to, to do this. It is to remind yourself of that truth to do justice and to love mercy. Any other closing thought? Yeah, I would just say that I think one of the biggest issues that we have with our political landscape is just a lack of common ground. And I think the ultimate common ground is the Imago Dei for us. It's, it's, yeah. it's human dignity. It's, it's the fact that everyone was created in the image of God regardless of what your religion is. And so I think when we think about issues in terms of human dignity, uh, you, number one, you see why religion is important. Number two, you value someone even before you know any of that other stuff about them. And, and religion can help be be very helpful with that. Amen. All right, well, uh, I think we have to wrap it up here. Uh, terrific discussion. I'd like to thank our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Please uh, let me okay. say my thanks on behalf of the Aspen Institute for such a content-rich discussion, such a beautiful, artful moderation. Um, and now let's drink and be merry, or eat, drink, and be merry. <laughs> Probably non-alcoholic. Outside in the hall, we're having a reception. So please join us, and thanks to all of you for being here. Thank you.